good evening students so today we are going to take up she stoops to conquer written by oliver goldsmith as you already know she stoops to conquer belongs to the genre of comedy of manners and let's look at some of the features of comedy of manners which automatically can be applied also to she stoops to conquer as you know comedy of manners is a play that dramatizes and often satirizes customs habits and standards in contemporary society and usually it contains witty dialogue and it satirically exposes human follies uh, you know negative characters etc it differs from other types of comedy such as the you have romantic comedies which evokes more like a pathos or pity or even sympathy this is intended uh, to suggest the weakness within people and also to laugh at their weaknesses and if you look at she stoops to conquer look at that title itself she stoops to conquer that she is stooping to a level to conquer anything at all obviously uh, here we talk about romance we talk about uh, relationships so obviously it talks about a woman who is ready to stoop to a level to conquer that man and it has been uh, forwarded or let's say put by oliver goldsmith in the most satirical and entertaining way uh, as a drama you have a lot of allegorical names within she stoops to conquer names that reflect a character's personality directly or indirectly you have also some some names are more like a speaking names that's one of the prominent features of uh, goldsmith's uh, she stoops to conquer more speaking names accurately signal the character's stereotyped nature let's look at some of the names which is mentioned Uh, in she stoops to conquer and these names has been suggested by goldsmith to uh, to to gather some amount of comic effect within the drama you have mrs odd fish look at that word odd fish so it means that uh, the woman itself is completely odd different from all the other uh, women then you have little cripple gate so that character might be crippling and you have aunt pedigree it's there within the word a woman who is more focused on the pedigree of people and even you have a character called tony lumpkin who makes fun of others with names invented by himself like quagmire marsh now these are fictional characters which are or let's say these are names which are given by tony lumpkin to two other characters which obviously we will look at at the later part of the uh, this video you have quagmire marsh that's a kind of a quagmire is a word which uh, most of the time we use in conversations or written language to suggest people which is a kind of a mess you have cracks kal common so you have an uncommon character the man is an uncommon character he is a cracks kal that's what it says then obviously you have major major characters like kate hardcastle which or who obviously is the heroine or the protagonist or you can call one of those protagonist of she stoops to conquer so kate hardcastle hardcastle is one character you then you have constance neville you know the weight the word constant constantly you have kate hardcastle which means kate is a strong personality hard as a castle george hastings george haste means quickly George is a character who is trying to quickly, uh, you know, elope with her lover from the scene. So you have that name, George Hastings. So these names have more significance and has one or the other associations with these uh, words like hard, constant, haste in their names, as I have suggested to you before. Now, talking about Goldsmith. She, he had contributed if you look at the background of the drama he had contributed she or he had dedicated uh, she stoops to conquer to dr johnson who already you know is a uh, uh, is a lexicographer or he is considered to be the first lexicographer who had come up with the dictionary called dr johnson's dictionary in 1755 
and Dr. Johnson in a, in a more symbolical level had adopted Goldsmith as his prodigy because the same characteristic Johnson applies to his works, you can see the same characteristics in the way uh, Goldsmith had portrayed characters. It's more about the reputation at the advancement or the influence that Goldsmith enjoy is also akin to that of Dr. Johnson. Now let's look at the title of the play, She Stoops to Conger. As I've told you earlier that it's about a woman who tries to conger a man and is ready to stoop to a different level uh, to attain the character of a barmaid so that uh, she is able to conger or gain the affections of Charles Marlowe who is only comfortable in the presence of lower class women, especially barmaids. Charles Mar Marlowe is from a noble family, but unfortunately he is not really good with noble women. But at the same time he is really good with barmaids. He is he's a, he's a man who exuberates confidence uh, when he talks with barmaids, not with, uh, with noble women. Now look at that, 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 that uh, imagine that way of character sketch. It itself gathers some amount of comic level up to it. So the original title of She Stoops to Conger was The Mystics of a Night. Why? Because it refers to the events that take place in, a, in one evening's time. So it's more like a uh, like Aristotelian unity of time, place and action. Let's look at characters. A lot of characters are there. but they are easy to remember for the fact that you have that allegorical name pasted on each character. You have the main character Kate Hardcastle. Uh, she is more balanced, resourceful and humorous in a way. She is a wealthy young woman who is ready to stoop to conquer by assuming a lower social position as a barmaid to attract a man with, whose name is Charles Marlowe she finds appealing. And Mr. Hardcastle is the father of Kate Hardcastle, going by the surname. Uh, she, now, Hardcastle is a conservative country gentleman, likes old things and dislikes cities, follies and forbids. So, for him, city is a symbol of everything that is bad, everything that is tricky. Whereas country or let's say village is a perfect symbol of goodness, is more traditional in his approach. And you have Mrs. Hardcastle who is more manipulative and vain and completely unlike her husband. She is not ever, never interested in a country life. She is always bored by the country life but she resorts to it just because her, his, her husband is more inclined to live in a country. And she is bored by the lack of social occasions and entertainment. She is drawn to the styles and fashions of London life. She wants to enjoy the London life. Then you have the next character, Tawny Lumpkin. And Tawny is a more rebellious, fun-loving young man whose pleasures are basically drinking and horseback riding. And Hardcastle or Mrs. Hardcastle is considered to be a kind of a guardian for Tawny Lumpkin. Then you have the next character, Charles Marlowe. And Charles Marlowe is singled out by Mr. Carr Hardcastle as a likely husband for Kate Hardcastle. So, Charles Marlowe uh, has been planned by Ma Mr. Hardcastle to be uh, his daughter's husband. But this plan he never shares with Marlowe. And Marlowe is painfully shy in a completely odd way. As I mentioned earlier, he is ill at ease with genteel women, genteel in the sense that lower class women and brazenly forward, sorry, uh, forward with women of humbler origin, sorry, uh, with not lower class women, genteel women in the sense noble women, whereas when it comes to humbler origin women, that is women from lower class, he is more brazenly forward, he is he's exuberates with confidence. And then you have next character George Hastings. George Hastings is Constance Neville. So, there is another character called Constance Neville. Uh, it is a woman and Constance Neville suitor. So, Constance is the woman who is in love with George Hastings. And uh, he is a well-educated young Londoner and a close friend of Charles Marlowe. So, 
George and Charles, they are friends. And George is in love with Constance. Now, George is more fluent, gentle and resourceful when compared to Charles Marlowe. And as he proves, when he devises a plan to elope with Constance, and he wants to elope with Constance uh, Neville. And Constance Neville is in, as I have told you before, is in love with George Hastings. And Constance Neville is an orphaned young woman who has inherited a casket of jewels that comprise a modest fortune. And where does or from whom does Constance Neville gets it? She, Constance Neville gets it from Mrs. Hardcastle. Actually, this whole jewel or fortune belongs to Constance Neville. But it has been kept by Mrs. Hardcastle. So, to elope, they need money. That is, George Hastings and Constance Neville needs money. And Constance expects this fortune uh, this modest fortune of jewels could contribute much to their future life. Then you have other characters too. Uh, they are not that major characters. They are more minor characters. They, are, they have very limited space in the drama. You have Digori. Digori is a servant in Hardcastle household. And you have four shabby fellows. They are Tony Lumpkin's drinking companions at the Three Pigeons Ale House, that's a kind of an inn or a bar. Then Jeremy is another servant in the Hardcastle household. Then you have the landlord of, or the proprietor of the Three Pigeons Ale House. Then you have the maid, a servant in the Hardcastle house. The maid is the one who informs Kate Hardcastle that Charles Marlowe has mistaken Kate Hardcastle for a barmaid and questions her mistress's decision to play the part. That's, that's something which we can discuss in Act 1. Then you have Sir Charles Marlowe, who is the father of Charles Marlowe, and is also an old friend of Mr. Hardcastle. Then again, going by the name, you have Aunt Pedigree. Now, if you look at that word pedigree, like her name, she also has the function of preserving the family line by preventing questionable marriages, that she is against this so-called love marriages uh, where people don't, uh, sorry, uh, where people don't uh, resort to the class system. And Aunt Pedigree is more forward in that manner, is not, not that forward in that matter, that she wants uh, whoever whom she knows uh, to get married to the class, according to the class. So, so the drama, it starts with the prologue and what is a prologue or what is the prologue all about? So in the prologue, the speak, a speaker comes to the stage and the speaker laments that the comic muse is gravely ill. So comic muse is, a, these are techniques implied to uh, comedy of manners or dramas. So this comic muse is gravely ill. That uh, the comic muse is gravely ill and the spectators in the audience should imagine the play they are going to watch as a medicine prescribed by a doctor to revive comedy. So the speaker says that our comic muse is gravely ill. So we want to cure that comic muse. So the spectators in the audience Therefore, should imagine that we are conducting this play and through this play we are going to cure this comic muse. The intention of the speaker is to make you prepare for the comical effect of the play. So now the audience will judge whether the play is an effective cure, that is effective comedy or not. That's what the prologue is all about. It also talks about the background of the characters that the setting of the character or in a way it has some elements within the act one too. That the old fashioned hound in the country you have the hard castle, the family hard castles who they are a couple in their late 50s and they discuss much about their country life and city life which we have already done in the character sketch. And Mrs. Hardcastle complains of the rust or the routine 
that is making her life so much of boring within the country while Mr. Hardcastle dismisses all this and says that the city life is full of follies and fopperies and it's better always to avoid that city life. Then, uh, then later they also converses about uh, Tony Lumpkin and Tommy Lumpkin is Mrs. Hardcastle's son by a former marriage. So by this we can we know that Mr. Hardcastle is might be the second marriage of Mrs. Hardcastle. So Mrs. Hardcastle's son is Tony Lumpkin and Mr. Hardcastle evidently considers Tony something of a wastrel that he wastes a lot of money just by drinking and meandering around with his friends. So for Mr. Hardcastle uh, in Malayalam you say uh, you know Mudiyanaya Putra. So prodigal son actually. So when the young man therefore enters, he refuses his mother's request to refrain from going to the three pigeons which is obviously the local alehouse or tavern where he uh, meets his friends and drinks. Then you have the ha Kate Hardcastle also comes into the picture. Kate Hardcastle as I have told you before is Mr. Hardcastle's daughter and she reveals that she has invited Charles Marlowe, the son of an old friend to visit the very sorry uh, yeah visit that very day as a potential husband for her. Kate ascends although she expresses some reservations to her cousin Constance Neville. So Kate agrees to this but uh, over the course of time she has some uh, actually there is a mistake within the slide I think it was Mr. Hardcastle invites uh, Sir Charles Marlowe's son uh, Charles Marlowe. Uh, to the uh, to the ale to the to their place, and Charles Marlowe doesn't know that uh, Kate Hardcastle is the is the daughter of Mr. Hardcastle, and uh, there is a proposal that is going on between his him and his father regarding uh, Kate Hardcastle's marriage to Charles Marlowe, and Kate discusses with her cousin Constance Neville about this whole affair, whole thing of getting married to this man called Charles Marlowe. And uh, further in Act 1 you have Constance's aunt and guardian Mrs. Hardcastle and Mrs. Hardcastle really wants his son to get married to Constance and there is a reason for that. It's not out of love, it's just out of the greedy, greediness for the inheritance from Constance. Constance's parents had left a lot of inheritance uh, for her. And by getting Tony married to Constance, uh, Mrs. Hardcastle wants the entire riches to be kept within her family only. And at the Three Pigeons Ale House, Tony Lumpkin entertains his, uh, his friends with a rollicking drinking song. So there is a song attached to the play. And the landlord announces the arrival of two young visitors who seems to be from London. So the landlord of the Three Pigeons says that see two people are coming from London um, to the Three Pigeons Ale House so you better be uh, better behave well. So when the travellers arrive confess they are lost. Tony plays a practical joke upon these, these travellers giving them complex directions to the Hardcastle's house but leading them to believe the private resident is really an inn. So, Actually, these two people who are coming to visit, they are George Hastings and uh, Charles Marlowe. But Tony wants to play a joke on them. So Tony, instead of giving the address of the Three Pigeons Ale House, had given the, uh, uh, the, the address of his stepfather, which is, which, who is Mr. Hardcastle's house. So instead of going to that inn, they have landed now Charles Marlowe and George Hastings had landed on uh, the house of Mr. Hardcastle and thinks it to be an ale house and that's why Charles Marlowe initially mistakes Kate Hard Hardcastle to be a barmaid. So in act 2 you have Mr. Hardcastle is training his servants to display good manners when visitors arrive for the family is not used to entertaining guests. Why? because it is a country area there is they seldom gets any guests. So after that he receives the young travellers Charles Marlowe and George Hastings 
The two visitors are under the impression that Mr. Hardcastle is an innkeeper just like the three pigeons go. A misunderstanding that gives occasion for some lightly comic asides, you know, expectation that Marlowe is expecting the Mr. Hardcastle to behave like a, a landlord of an alehouse, whereas Mr. Hardcastle wants Charles Marlowe to be a gentleman, but un unfortunately, uh, since it's a bar, Marlowe and Hastings behaves as if, uh, you know, how you behave in a bar. Whereas you have constant Neville enters and quickly realizes that Tony has played another of his practical jokes. You have to understand that Constant Neville has already in love with George Hastings and they have a plan to elope. And this whole uh, thing of coming here and meeting with uh, Mr. Hardcastle is a plan of George Hastings to elope with Constant Neville. And Constant Neville directly understands now that Tony has played a practical joke upon both of them. But she and Hastings decide not to clear up this matter with Marlowe and thus continue pretending the house is a inn. So, uh, you have to look here that Charles Marlowe is the fool here. George Hastings understands the trick that has been played by uh, Tony Lumpkin. But he plays around because he wants to elope with Constance. So, therefore, he doesn't you know, uh, make his friend Charles Marlowe uh, deviate from uh, you know, acting weirdly. The young man's first encounter with Kate Hardcastle, that is Charles Marlowe's encounter, develops awkwardly with Marlowe suffering acutely from bashfulness. So, how, so Marlowe is a kind of a different kind of a character. He's more like shy, timid, reserved with young ladies of high social status, whereas he is more at ease with young women from humbler backgrounds like barmaids. Now, it's an interesting character. At the same time, you cannot find such a kind of a character. Now, that, in fact, gives a lot of humor to the play. Therefore, Kate impersonates like a barmaid as she finds Marlowe appealing. That Kate wants to play around. So, she will, as the title suggests, stoop socially, actually. That is, she is stooping from the level of a nobler woman to a barmaid so that he could, she could win the favor of this young man. And the scene ends with Mr. Mrs. Hardcastle discussion of her fascination with London, its fashionable ways and latest style trends with George Hastings. Unknown to her, Hastings plans to elope with Constant and to enlist Tony Lumpkin for the success of this project. So, Tony is uh, also knows about this relationship as we. Uh, could gather from this act. Next you have act 3. And in act 3, Hardcastle and Kate discuss their contrasting reaction to young Marlowe. Now Kate's father, Mr. Hardcastle, finds this young man, which is Marlowe, impudent. But Kate assures him to be exemplary. That he is not happy with the way this man is flirting around with his daughter. But Kate says that let's give him some time. Because he is a good man, I am testing him. And Tony succeeds, at the same time, Tony succeeds in fitching the jewel casket that contains constant in that, that he steals the casket from his mother so that he could give it to Constance and George Hastings, who is on an elopement plan. So, Tony Lumpkin is a very good fellow. Actually, he is a supporter of this because he doesn't want to get married to uh, Constance. So, in the past, Constant used to pester her aunt to give them to her, that is these jewels. But Mrs. Hardcastle has refused because he wants to make a match between his, her son and Constant. Now, Mrs. Hardcastle is distraught upon discovering that her uh, bureau, that is bureau is a kind of a shelf, has been broken into and the jewels has been taken by somebody. Meanwhile, Marlowe is so enchanted with this woman that he met, that is Kate, and flirts with her openly and attempts to embrace her. Her father, Mr. Hardcastle, witnesses this and scolds his daughter to behave. And he also attempts to ask the visitors to leave because of Marlowe's, you know, irrespectability. But Kate says she will prove that the young man is worth if her father will grant her one more hour to do so. That this is a kind of a test which has been given by Kate to 
uh, Marlowe. And in Act 4, you have George and Constance discussing about their elopement plan and also discuss about the whereabouts of the jewel casket before their elopement. And John, they, they, Tony Lumpkin has given it to them. And George, what he does is that he had given it to Charles Marlowe for safekeeping because he feels that it might get lost. And Charles, you know, out of this, uh, then gave it to the landlady, Mrs. Hardcastle, because Charles thought that this is a woman from the ale house. So let me give her this so that she would safe keep it. So the jewels are, you know, in a circling manner, in a humorous manner, are back with where they started. And Hastings resigns himself to elopement without Constance few fortune. Now Hastings is trapped. Now he can't get it back. Now Hastings uh, decided that, okay, let's not, you know, uh, wait for this jewels. Let's elope. Let's go with the plan. And Marlowe waxes eloquent on the looks and appeal of the barmaid and hearing this her father becomes so angry and demands Marlowe to leave the house. Marlowe in turn demands Hardcastle give him the bill and Kate is determined to deceive Marlowe as long as she can and pretend she is a poor relation of the family. But the truth about Hardcastle wrestling is soon unveiled and Marlowe is mortified at the same time he is so embarrassed in behaving in such a way to his father's friend Mr. Hardcastle. Meanwhile, Mrs. Hardcastle reads a letter from George Hastings to Tony Lumpkin regarding the planned development. She becomes so furious and she rants she will convey Constance to Aunt Pedigree for safekeeping. That she is trying to recommend Constance to Aunt Pedigree so that Pedigree would safe keep her. So that later Tony should get married to uh, Constance. And Hastings and Marlowe both express their irritation and frustration to Tony Lumpkin for, for playing the practical joke upon them. But Tony in turn promises that at the end of the act that he will save the day, that he will uh, save the entire confusion. And so Hastings and Marlowe, uh, so Tony says that, okay, everything will be solved by Tony himself because he is the one who started this whole mess. So he will uh, make it make it okay for almost everybody. That's what he assures. And in Act Five, Mrs. Hardcastle has ridden off with Constant Neville, and Sir Charles Marlowe, which is who is Marlowe's father, has arrived at the house. He now enters with Hardcastle. Both of them expressing amusement at the misidentification of Hardcastle as an innkeeper. A young Marlowe enters to apologize. Whereas Hardcastle teases him on his forward approach to Kate and question and Kate in turn is questioned by both her father and Sir Charles. When asked about Marlowe's feelings, she answers that young Charles did indeed profess affection for her after he has denied such sentiments. Kate invites both fathers to conceal themselves behind a screen to witness the truth of her statement. That is, uh, earlier, Marlowe had flirted with a barmaid. Now Marlowe knows that it is a, is a noble woman, Kate. But Kate feels that Marlowe still loves him, her. So they, she asks her father and her and uh, Sir Charles Marlowe to be uh, to be to be behind the screen and witness the confession of Marlowe's love to her. Meanwhile, you have. In the Hardcastle's garden, Hastings means Tony Lumpkin and who asserts that he has led Mrs. Hardcastle and Constance around in a circle rather than to Aunt Pedigree's house so that Constance can be, uh, you know, robbed off from Mrs. Hardcastle's presence and be again reunited with uh, George Hastings. Now, Mrs. Hardcastle enters in the garden and frightened by this confusing journey in the darkness, and Tony leads his mother to believe that they are far from home and may encounter a highwayman or robbers. He urges her to conceal herself. Mrs. Hardcastle again enters. His appearance adds to Mrs. Hardcastle's consternation. Hastings and Constance then enter. Furthering this confusion, there is a complete chaos within the darkness. And Constance now tells Hastings that she has decided not to allow but to seek Hardcastle's consent for their marriage. Now back inside, 
Sir Charles and Mr. Hardcastle behind the screen witnesses the encounter between Kate and a young Marlow. And Kate reveals she is Mr. Hardcastle's daughter. And Tony Lumpkin formally renounces romantic interest in Constance. And the play ends with the prospects of marriage. And Constance to hating Hastings and Kate to young Marlow. So these this these are the things that are that that happens within the act 5 and then you have the epilogue 1 and 2 which and with the epilogue and 1 and 2 uh, the it's the end of the whole um, play so the play had uh, led to a very nice a very good conclusion and the epilogue 1 is delivered by the performer who is playing the character of Kate Hardcastle here in the epilogue one what happens is that uh, Goldsmith summarizes the progress of the plot emphasizing how Kate stooped to conquer thus emphasizing the title and the epilogue two is delivered by the character who that uh, by Tony Lumpkin or the character or the person who played the character of Tony Lumpkin here epilogue two Again, Goldsmith is emphasizing that the speaker boasts of his carefree spirit and independence. So, Tony Lumpkin, a man who cares for his independence, is finally got his independence because he is not uh, he is not taken seriously by his mother and father. Uh, he was not given any money. He was uh, he 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 was he has always been made to believe that he is he has not become matured of his age. So finally here he achieves independence and Kate uh, is able to achieve uh, his sorry her the man he she always wanted to get married to. So this ends the uh, the whole structure of the play in the next video we will look at the themes of the play. Thank you.